Hi, yeah, so I'm uh, Dr. John Charles Say, and um, I'm basically a criminal law academic, and the talk that I'm going to give to you today is a bit more lawy than Andreas's one. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's an important issue that needs to be engaged with, and basically it's about this idea of guilt by association. It's about the idea of when is somebody potentially liable for a serious criminal offence, not because they have caused the harm directly, they haven't sort of stabbed the person, hit them on the head, smashed the property, whatever it might be. They haven't done that, but rather they've associated in some way with that crime being committed by another party. So, nice simple example, James hires Lucy to kill Fred. So in this scenario, the principal offender, the one who's actually causing the harm, committing the kind of, in this sense, the, the offence of murder directly, is obviously Lucy. She's the one that's doing the killing. But James is guilty of something. There's something blameworthy about James's role. He may not have actively been the one that caused the death, but nevertheless, he is associated sufficiently with the crime to be deserving of some kind of liability. Now, that could be, in this sense, a very direct one of hiring another person, but equally it could be assisting them in some way, providing weaponry, providing tools for a heist, for a robbery, or uh, simply encouraging them, like emboldening someone to commit a crime. All of these things are potentially blameworthy, and the law needs to respond to them, and it does so in two ways. So at the bottom is set out there. The first one is what we call complicity. And this is essentially where I assist or encourage or embolden or supply someone with, with the tools to commit their crime, such as hiring Lucy to kill Fred. And Lucy actually goes on to commit that offence. And in that scenario, not only is James um, simply liable for an offence, but he's liable for an offence as if he had committed that principal offence of murder. So in this scenario, James would be labelled as a murderer, would be tried as a murderer, and would be subject to the mandatory life sentence if found guilty. Below that, we have this what's called a sort of inchoate, which just simply means in uh, uh, not quite finished, assisting and encouraging offence. And in this case, of course, assisting and encouraging murder. Now this applies where James hires Lucy, but Lucy, for whatever reason, doesn't actually kill Fred, either because she doesn't want to, so she says no, or she is not able to, or simply the law wants to intervene at an earlier point. Now, in that scenario, we're not going to say that James is a murderer, because obviously no murder has taken place, but rather we still want some kind of criminal liability, so we say that he's guilty of assisting and encouraging murder. Now, we want these. Why do we want these to be criminalised? Well, for, for pretty obvious reasons. In relation to complicity, well, James hasn't actually done the killing, but there's every reason to say that his culpability could be just as bad as Lucy, who has done. Um, in fact, in some ways, we could say he's even worse, this kind of Mr. Big type scenario. You can imagine sort of gang type violence. There might be someone who's orchestrating that who doesn't actually get involved. Or particularly with organised crime and organised um, sort of high level crime, again, there can be individuals who don't actively take part in the crime, but are nevertheless in many ways more blameworthy perhaps than the people that do. So the law needs that kind of ability to intervene and punish them appropriately and label them appropriately. There's also what's called the forensic advantage of complicity, and this is important. So this basically means that if we label and we punish the people who assist and encourage in exactly the same way as the people that do commit the crime, then actually sometimes we don't need to identify which one's which. So if we have a gang, for example, all of which beat someone up and eventually kill them, we don't have to identify you're the one that committed the fatal blows, because often that will be very, very difficult. But as long as you can demonstrate that either that person was the one that dealt the fatal blows, or they at least assisted or encouraged um, aided the vetted counsel procured the others around them, then we can say either or, we're still going to try you as a murderer, either as a principal offender, the person who did the act, or as someone who has assisted and encouraged. And that's very important in, in relation to gang type violence, and also um, another place where it's particularly uh, important is in relation to domestic abuse. Um, ab abuse of children in particular within a family home, where again, you might not be able to tell between the two parents who was the principal offender and who was simply the one who authorised or accepted what was going on. But nevertheless, if you can demonstrate that it's definitely one of the two, then you can try them both in exactly the same way and there's not a block to liability. In relation to inchoate offendings, similarly really, I mean again, um, the crime, the principal crime, the murder in this case, hasn't come about, but that's no thanks to James. Like, James hired someone to kill poor old Fred. So in that sense, he's still done something that's worthy of criminalisation. It's his good luck that it never happened. But nevertheless, we want something that recognises that guilt. Um, and also, of course, we want some way of preventing harm, if possible, within the criminal law. If the police find out that someone's been hired to murder someone else, we want a mechanism whereby we can intervene and find liability. Maybe not for murder as such, but certainly for something. We want to recognise that that's blameworthy. And that's what the so-called inchoate offence gives us. 
But on the other hand, we've got to be worried, and we, ha we have to be worried with these kind of offences for two reasons. The first one is the potential for overcriminalization. Okay, we want to be able to intervene early, and we want to be able to say that if you associate yourself in some way with another's crime, that you should also be guilty. But we need to know how. We need to know what it is that that person has done that makes them guilty. We know for the murderer, they've killed somebody with the intention of killing or the intention of causing really serious harm. But we don't know for definite with this so-called complicit sort of the association. And we don't know with the inchoate offence either. So in the, with the first one, the complicity, we, James hasn't killed. So what has he done? What is in the legal terms? What's the wrong that here that we're trying to criminalise? And the problem with the current law is that it doesn't really identify that wrong, and it's not consistently identified either within the sort of case law or within um, legislation. And so this is my first worry, which is a major theme, of one that actually if you don't identify a wrong, then the risk is you overcriminalize because you simply keep going and saying anyone associated is enough. And also you get incoherence. If you don't know what you're criminalizing, then the decisions between where to draw the lines are simply become arbitrary. And we have a similar issue with inchoate liability as well here. No killing has even taken place this time. There's not even that harm that we can attach liability to and derive it from. So again, we have to say, what are we punishing him for? What are we punishing James for? We need to identify consistently that wrong. And it's worth looking at those themes of overcriminalization and incoherence in relation to those two categories of offences. So the first one, and so, as I say, the law of complicity, blah, 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 Section 8 of the Accessories and Betters Act, 1861, nice modern statute to tell us what to do. Um, on, on to, there's two parts to any criminal offence, generally. So there's the physical part, the bit that you do that causes the harm, and then you've got the mental part that you have to have when associated with that, which makes it legitimate for us to blame you for your physical actions. So here, in terms of the physical part, it's assisting, encouraging, causing. You've assisted, you've encouraged someone else to do something. And on the mental part, this is very controversial. There's no clarity here within the case law. But broadly speaking, the, what we can get is there must be some kind of an intention to do your actions of assisting and encouraging. But then in relation to whether that future offence actually comes about, that murder of Fred by Lucy, for that, it's enough that you simply foresee a risk that it might happen. Not that you intend it, not that you believe it, not that you want it, but simply that you foresee a risk that it might happen. Now, because of this, the way the law is developed, both of these are very, very wide. And it leads to these issues, as I say, of overcriminalization and coherence. So just a few examples to show this. Lucy tells James that she's going to kill Fred. James says, oh, goody. Doesn't seem very much. Doesn't really have any impact. It's not really going to change anything. She was going to do it anyway. But he said, oh, goody. Now, according to the current law, has he done something which is assisting or encouraging? Yes, he's encouraged. He said, oh, goody. That's emboldening. That's enough. Does he intend to do so? Yes, he does. Does he foresee a risk that she's going to go on to kill? Yes, he does. So therefore, he's liable. And not just liable for sort of, you know, a trifling misdemeanor offence. He's liable for murder if she goes on to kill. He'll be tried, labelled and punished as a murder, murderer and subject to the mandatory life sentence. Lucy tells James that she's going to uh, beat up Fred this time badly. James says again, oh goody. So again, on the sort of action side, if she goes on to then kill Fred, well, has he done something which is capable of assisting and encouraging? Yes, again, oh goody is enough. Now on the mental part, you might say, well, this time he doesn't foresee that she's going to kill. But actually, he doesn't have to, because the principal offence of murder is committed when you kill somebody, either with the intention to kill them, or with the intention to at least cause them serious harm. So therefore, tracing that into the kind of the association, the complicity example, all he has to do is foresee that. So all he has to foresee is that she might cause serious harm, which he does. So again this time, very little impact in his action, very little mental blameworthiness, and yet liable for murder and a mandatory life sentence. Then we've got James keeps watch whilst Lucy burgles his parents' house. James is concerned that Lucy may be violent, if disruptive, <coughs> and made a promise that she won't be. In terms of the burglary bit, that's fine, that's obvious. There's, there is complicity in that. If she commits the burglary, he wants that to happen. He's acting as a lookout. But the question is, what happens if she is disturbed and then she kills? Would he be liable as a murderer, as an accomplice to murder? And the answer in the current law, again, is yes. Has he done something which is capable of assisting and encouraging, or does assist and encourage? Yes. He's there, he's there helping, we're acting as a lookout. Does he intend to do so? Yes, he does. And does he at least foresee a risk that within the scope of their joint venture together, that she might commit murder or might cause serious harm? Again, yes, he does. He specifically warns against it, and he says he doesn't want it, but he does foresee a risk of it. 
So again, to be liable as a murderer, you have to intend to kill or cause really serious harm. To be liable for a murderer as an accomplice, it's enough for this, that you simply foresee a risk, even if you actively don't want that risk. And the last one is a nice one just because it's from a relatively recent uh, Supreme Court case, the case of Nango, which is where, so I've just transferred the facts to James and Lucy again, but James shoots at Lucy, Lucy shoots back, misses James and hits an innocent bystander, Fred. Now in this scenario, the potential here is the liability for the murder of Fred again. Does he do something which assists and encourage? Yes, by shooting at the other person, you're encouraging them to shoot back. Um, intending to do so, yes. Does he foresee a risk that murder might be committed? Yes, the murder of him. He's, he thinks he's in a gunfire. But now, because she misses, she hits Fred and Fred dies, she's liable for the murder of Fred. And importantly, James is now liable for murder as well, for assisting and encouraging essentially the attempted murder of himself. But now he's liable for murder as a result of that. And the similar thing we have for these inchoate assisting and encouraging offences as well. Acts capable of assisting and encouraging. Remember, for the inchoate offence, it doesn't matter whether that principal offence comes about or not. Whether she kills or not is entirely irrelevant. We're having liability simply at the point of the assisting and encouraging. Again, an intentional belief that you're going to assist or encourage. And again, this very flabby, wide idea of just foreseeing a risk that that future offence might come about. And again, similar kind of examples. James is watching England play football. James shouts that Rooney should kick one of the opposition. Is it an act capable of assisting and encouraging? Yes, it won't encourage, of course not. But it's capable of it. Probably won't be heard, but it's still capable of it, so that's enough. Does he foresee a risk that it might happen? Maybe. And if he does, he's liable. Liable for assisting and encouraging um, an offence against the person, even though Rooney would never hear. And even if he did hear, he wouldn't take any notice anyway. James sells Lucy a hammer in a hardware shop. James is concerned that Lucy has been recently accused of criminal damage. So at this point, is James liable for assisting and encouraging criminal damage? Again, the, the answer is yes. Does he do something which is capable of assisting and encouraging criminal damage? Yes, he sells the hammer. Does he intend to do so? Yes, he does. Does he at least foresee a risk that she's going to go on to commit criminal damage? Again, yes, he does. So therefore, he's liable. Even though Lucy is an upstanding citizen, all the rumours were wrong, she's not planning to go on to do anything, and all he's done is sell her a hammer in a hardware shop. And yet, liability for this very serious offence. And lastly, this is an example when I was, uh, used to work in a law reform body that exercised this quite a lot. James sees Lucy's car approaching from behind him very in the fast lane. James moves over. Exactly the same. You're assisting the person to speed by moving over. You foresee the risk that they're going to. So again, you're assisting and encouraging and liable for the same level as penalty as the person who's actually done the speeding. And this is the funniest bit. This offence has been created, and there was recognition that actually it is horribly wide. These kind of examples can't be acceptable within the law. So what they did is, rather than trying to actually identify what the wrong is that this offence is all about, and narrowing liability in that way, they created a defence, the defence of acting reasonably. Now, a defence of acting reasonably is an admission of defeat for any criminal offence. Because you're essentially saying, we're going to criminalise everything, and then you as a defendant is going to tell us why what you did was reasonable and you shouldn't be punished for it. That's a complete perversion of the presumption of innocence. The whole idea of the criminal law is you criminalise wrongs. You're saying you have done something which is bad and now we punish you for it. Not that you have done something, now tell me why it's a good thing that you did it. So what, where do we go from here? The, uh, and the first option, this is a kind of sorry little tale from the Law Commission. The Law Commission is a non-governmental body, but it's funded by the government. It's a main law reform body. And essentially they looked into both of these areas um, and I worked for them actually briefly um, on these projects when they looked at both types of this sort of association type offences. And what the Law Commission wanted to do is they said that the offence of complicity at the top is too wide, so we're going to narrow that right down. And you should only be complicit if you absolutely intend that that future offence should come about. So by really narrowing complicity, the only worry then was, what was if people fall through the net? and then they're not liable for the inchoate offence underneath. So what the Law Commission said was, OK, we can narrow complicity, but broaden the inchoate offence. Broaden the inchoate offence to make sure it at least catches people that now miss out on the top one. Now, unfortunately, because the project took a long time and it was very, very complicated, they ended up separating the two halves of the report and publishing them separately. And so, in the wonderful world of law reform, what happened was, the bit on complicity, the bit at the top that they wanted to narrow the current law, never made it through, nothing has been acted upon. But the bit of law reform that acted on the inchoate version, the one that they were expanding in order to facilitate this narrowing of complicity at the top, did make its way through, which is the Serious Crime Act, which I mentioned earlier. So we now have a situation of a horrible, flabby, big complicity offence at the top, 
and a horrible big flabby um, inchoate liability offence at the bottom, which was meant to go along with a coherent narrowing at the top. So we have entirely an area of law which is incoherent between the two sides, both of which are arguably, and I would certainly argue, over-criminalising. And even within each one, there's a lack of coherence as well. Because not only did the government accept the Law Commission's widening of the inchoate version, but they widened it exponentially more in those final stages within Parliament. So where can we go from here? I mean, what's the kind of the opportunity to go forward? And there is an opportunity, and this is important. So at the moment, the Justice Commission, uh, or the Justice Committee, sorry, within the House of Commons is reviewing, again, the inchoate form of liability, and it's very likely that that, that, will, that review will lead somewhere, and I hope it does. Um, and so there's a potential there for, for bringing in and bringing back some <coughs> coherence. And equally, it's likely that the complicity part, the bit at the top, is going to be sent back to the Law Commission again. So again, there's another opportunity for potential review there. But my major point here, it's true of all criminal offences, actually, but I think particularly true of complicity, because it's hard to pin down sometimes exactly what we're trying to criminalise. And that is to think, if we're going to seek fairness, if we're going to seek coherence, if we want to evolve... Uh, avoid over-criminalisation. The only way to do that is to begin with identifying the wrong that a criminal offence is trying to criminalise and having some kind of consensus around that. So we have some options. I mean, a lot of theorists argue that complicity in case offences are about causing. You're liable, you've done something wrong because you have caused the other person to commit a particular criminal offence. Now, that's fine. You could base the law around those themes, but then, oh goody, can't be acceptable. Shouting something out in a football stadium that definitely isn't going to be heard by anyone can't be acceptable basis for liability. So if that's going to be your coherent theme to base your wrong around, that's where the law has to be reformed. It could be an association with another's commission. So in that sense, we would require at least maybe some kind of intention to associate with that commission, some kind of uh, willingness from the defendant themselves that the crime should come about, as opposed to simply foreseeing a potential risk. It could be about association just with someone. So it could be about, if you know someone's a bit dodgy, definitely don't go around with them. Don't help them, don't assist them, don't encourage them. Now it could be that, but that's very hard to justify and it would have to be justified. And lastly, it could just simply be about an intention. But if it is about an intention, then require intention. Don't say that everyone's liable simply because they foresaw a risk and then allow them to try and defend themselves. Now, in all of these ways, what it boils down to is a bit, essentially an incompatibility, to my mind anyway. When you have these kind of very serious offences, so murder is a very easy example to use, and it's the most serious offence within the criminal law, and it leads to a mandatory life sentence. It's the only one within the criminal law that does that. To be liable as a principal offender for actually committing murder, you have to do a very, very serious act. You have to do something, action, omission, that causes the death of another person. And we only think you're sufficiently culpable for that very, very serious offence if not only do you do the killing, but you do so with the intention to kill, or with at least with the intention to cause really serious harm. Now alongside that, for complicity to find the same penalty for someone that simply does an act which could assist or encourage, the oh goody example, and simply foresees a risk that the principal offender might kill or might cause serious harm, must be inadequate. Thank you.